If this is your first time here, yes, we are a weird church, and we will do fun stuff like that. Um, I have this secret confession, and that is I have a dream of the Rimple family going on Family Feud. How many would watch that episode? We would probably lose really bad, but it would be fun to watch, okay? But we're kicking off a series all about excuses, and we're looking at three things that God has given us to be good stewards of, and that's time, talent, and treasure. And so today we're going to talk about time, specifically giving God his time. We're going to be looking at the church And I feel like the church lately in our culture has been under a bit of attack. It's not cool to be a part of God's church right now. And I think it's a good time to talk about this and and what the church is. And really, we need that reminder sometimes to remember why church is important. And I'm pumped to talk about the church because I love the church. Like, I love the global church, the church I also love the local church. I love my church. I love 2911. I'm not ashamed about it. We have an awesome church, great worship, powerful messages. People are just so awesome and friendly here. Amazing coffee. I mean, I love my church, okay? I'm not ashamed. I will tell people I love my church. I have loved the church even as a little girl. When I was two years old, um, my family was getting ready for church on a Sunday morning. And we lived in New Jersey at the time, and it was a split-level home. So for those of you who don't know, you walk into the front door, and there is a little landing, and then you have stairs that will take you upstairs, and you have stairs that will go downstairs, okay? And so it's Sunday morning, early, we're getting ready, and I'm upstairs with my mom. She gets me ready, then she's getting herself ready. My dad is downstairs. He's helping my little bro- my brothers get ready. And somewhere in, in that mix, and everyone kind of busy, I decided at two years old I was ready for church. And I didn't want to wait. And so I just go to the front door and I leave. I walk out. And it takes a little bit of time for my parents to realize Kirsten is gone. They search the house. They search the backyard. They search the front yard. Now, as a parent, this is um, not the best feeling. Am I right? Okay. And I was talking to my mom about this recently. And she was like, you know, it's just weird. I, I just, I stayed pretty calm through this. Like, I don't know what it was, but I just didn't panic. But they take off, my, my mom takes off foot down the neighborhood in one direction, and my dad gets in the car and starts going the other direction. And they're calling out my name um, through the neighborhood, Kirsten, Kirsten. And, and this guy comes out to my mom, and, and, sh- and he goes, are you looking for a little girl? My mom says, yes. And he goes, was she dressed up nice? And my mom says, yes. And he goes, I saw a car pick her up. Now, this is when you panic, okay? This would be the time you panic, am I right? And uh, the guy tells my mom kind of the make and the model, the the color of the car, and and he goes, you know, it just headed that direction. Now, this was before cell phones, okay? So my mom couldn't just, like, whip out the phone and call 911. So she just takes off in that direction, like, probably with the fury of a mother, okay? Like, I cannot imagine this moment. And she goes in that direction. She goes all the way to the end of the neighborhood, and then she looks across the street, and she sees a church, and she sees the car parked that he described in the parking lot, and she walks into the church, and guess what? There I was, sitting at the front of the church. It wasn't our church, but it was a church. (laughs) Apparently, this couple picked me up because I was dressed for church, and they just brought me to the closest church, but there I was, and I just love that story because even at two years old, I was like, get me to the house of the Lord, okay? I need to get in church. You all taking too long. It's good that I loved church growing up because I was a pastor's kid, and, and so we were in church all the time. The joke is with pastor's kids, you're basically born on the front row, which is actually a pretty disturbing image if you think about it. But I bet there's a pastor who could use that as, a, as an illustration. Um, but I, before my dad passed away this last year, he was about to hit 40 years in ministry, him and my mom, since uh, they graduated Bible college. And um, this past year, my mom you know, became a widow And it's been a really hard year, a really tough year. But I just want to brag on her for a second because even through that, I mean, serving God for that lady, it just can't stop, won't stop. You know what I mean? And so she recently decided that she wanted to learn a new language. And so my middle-aged white mom of a woman decided she was going to learn Spanish. And, uh... And so she just downloaded some programs, and she just started teaching herself Spanish. And I, 
And she would practice on me, so I'd call her, and I'd, I'd say, hey, mom. She'd say, hola, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, and it didn't sound good, <laughs> but, but she kept at it, and she actually got really good. In fact, a few months ago, she went on a missions trip to Mexico, and they asked her to preach a sermon in the church they were serving at, and she preached a whole sermon in Spanish. And I saw a video of it, and it sounded good. Like, she was preaching fire. And it could have been really bad. I don't know. But it sounded good. So I don't know what your excuses are, but you learn, take a, book, a page out of my mom's book, man. Step up, right? And listen, as we talk about church, I just want to say first off, yes, church is not perfect. I don't look for church to be perfect. And neither should you. Sometimes we think about the church in the New Testament as this uh, picture-perfect thing and, and people just passionate for the Lord, but it was messy then. I mean, if you read through Corinthians, Paul has to address a lot of issues. He had a guy in the church sleeping with his stepmother, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look it up. I know. I'm sorry if your children are in the room. You probably should have checked them into the kids' ministry. Um, <laughs> this is not PG, okay? They had people, Christians, getting drunk with communion. They had people suing each other. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus addresses, he talks about the seven early churches. And five out of the seven, he has to call them out and says that they need to repent. And so church has been messy. It's still messy, right? There are times it's messy. There's a lot of work to do. But even still, even then, we are instructed in Hebrews 10, verse 24 through 25, it says this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good yeah. deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Believers are given this clear direction. Don't stop meeting together. And this is really what the church is, right? It's, it's Christians coming together. It's the assembly of believers. And we refer to church as buildings, and, you know, that's where my church is located. But we know that really it's not the building that makes the church, right? It's the people coming together. And the church was established after Jesus' death and resurrection. We have, we have the new covenant. We have the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we see the church form and spread through the book of Acts and and one way that scripture talks about the church is through the use of metaphors. And this is really just to help us understand, I think, more of the purpose of the church and what it is and also how God sees it. And so there's a lot of metaphors. I just want to look at a few real quick to give us a better understanding. And the first one is this. The church is the body. The body. This is probably the most common metaphor you'll see in scripture of the church. And there's two good passages that teach us this, both written by Paul. The first is Colossians 1.18. It says, he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. Ephesians 5.21 says, the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. And so scripture gives us this clear picture, right, that, ch that the church is like a body, and the head of this body is Jesus. And so as a physical head directs the physical body, so also Christ directs his church, right? And I love this picture because it helps communicate this connection that we should have to Christ. I mean, think about this. When Paul was persecuting Christians, when he was, back then when he was Saul, and the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. He calls out to him, and the Lord doesn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? Or why are you persecuting Christians? What does he say? He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That's how connected Christ is to the body. Persecution to the church is persecution to him. It makes you think a little bit more about how we talk about the church, right? And this metaphor also helps us understand our relationship with each other, doesn't it? In Ephesians 4, it says, From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. 1 Corinthians 12 says this, But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. 
If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. The body of Christ has to work together to be successful. And I believe the enemy tries to attack the church through division and competition, right? I mean, imagine trying to run a race with both of your legs fighting against each other, right? You would trip and fall on your face. You wouldn't get very far. But our goal as a church is to be united behind the mission, guided by our head of the church, which is Christ, right? And we have to fight to be unified as the body of Christ, not just within our church of 2911, but I also think we got to fight to support and cheer on other churches in Tempe, in Arizona, and even around the world to do whatever we can in our ability to cheer them on. And some people confuse unity in the church to mean conflict-free. Okay, we don't want to be a dysfunctional family that never deals with issues because we're scared of conflict. Unity doesn't always mean conflict-free, and it doesn't mean we will compromise truth for unity, but it does mean that we don't hate people because we disagree with them. It means we don't see other churches or ministries as competition, right? And we celebrate that God uses different churches that use different methods to accomplish the same mission. We are one body, united, behind God, teaching his word to reach people. The second metaphor I want to look at is the church is the bride. It says this in Revelation 19, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory because the wedding celebration of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. She was permitted to be dressed in bright, clean, fine linen, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. This metaphor of the bride is similar to the body, but I think it communicates more of an intimate relationship and a purity that we have with the Lord. It it really helps us understand the Lord's just deep affection and love for his church, that he will care for and protect his church. I feel like I've seen a lot of articles recently or or heard people talk about this idea of, you know, will the church survive the pandemic? Will it survive post-COVID? Or or can the church and Christianity survive in the midst of cancel culture? And honestly, this this question kind of baffles me because the answer is pretty obvious, and it's always yes, right? The church will withstand because Jesus says, I will establish my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He is a good husband that will protect and care for his bride. And it makes me also feel bad for anyone who comes against the church because you better watch out for an angry husband. Am I right? The third metaphor I want to talk about is the church is the temple. A temple is a place or a structure specifically associated with or set apart for God to dwell. It says this in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 through 17, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. Hello, jealous husband over here. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. In the Old Testament, the temple was the place where God would dwell among the people of Israel. But when Jesus died on the cross, that went from a room and it went into us. God dwells in us. So it fits that when we come together, God dwells in this place. We have to realize that God placed us in this location, in this city, to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. And so often, people walk through our doors and they don't even have the words to put to it, but they, they have this overwhelming feeling, a, a sense of longing that this is what they've been looking for. And, and I, they don't know how to define it always, but it's, it's the spirit. It's the move of God's spirit in this place. It's believers. When we come together, this isn't another concert. It's not another nonprofit or club. It's the Holy Spirit moving through this place. It's powerful and it's life-changing. Believers worshiping together, I mean, think about this. It's like a heaven on earth kind of moment. This is a glimpse into our eternity when every tongue and tribe and nation will be together in heaven with the angels praising God for all eternity. We get to have a little taste of heaven on earth when we come together and we worship God. That's why it's so powerful. 
This is a temple. It's the place where God dwells. You are his temple. And the purpose of the church, it, it really comes down to three simple things. And the first thing is this, worshiping God, right? He deserves our worship. He takes delight in hearing the praise of his children. And I'm pretty sure I can't conform, confirm it, but I'm pretty sure he does like loud worship, okay? Just saying, <laughs> hit those drums. We worship God as the church. The second thing is to build each other up. The word for this in scripture you'll see is edification. And it really means to encourage and to grow together. God designed his church to be a catalyst for growth. For believers, the church is like a spiritual gym, okay? You go to the gym to exercise, right? You get on that treadmill and you hit go and you're like, okay, I'm going to sweat it out, all right? Now, the other day I realized that my keys were getting a little bit uh, heavy and I was kind of getting close to that like janitor level with my key ring and it was just a lot of jang jangling around. And so I was like, I need to clean out my key ring. So I sat down to kind of go through my keys and, and I got angry because I realized that my LA Fitness membership tag is still on my key ring. And I was mad about it because it's been a long time since I've been to LA Fitness, but still it's there. Um, but the reason I've kept it on, and this is really embarrassing to admit to you, it's because technically I'm still a member, okay? They make it really hard to cancel memberships for a reason. Um, but I was still a, a member, and, uh, and I'm ashamed about that. But I, it made me think that a lot of people treat church like I do the gym. Like, I'm technically a member, but if I don't go, do I reap any of the benefits of being a member? I, absolutely not, right? Like, if, if there was a gym membership that was, like, optimum results, zero attendance, sign me up, okay? Like, that sounds awesome. Take all my money, okay? But that's not how it works, right? Like, it doesn't do me any good if I don't show up and do the work. And many Christians stay stagnant in their faith because they don't show up and do the work. Check this out in Hebrews. I want to read this to you. Hebrews 5.12, it says this. By this time, you ought to be teachers. But you need someone to teach you the very first principles of God's word all over again. You need milk not solid food. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a baby without experience in applying the word about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature. And then listen to this. For those whose faculties have been trained by continuous exercise to distinguish good from evil. A church helps us to apply God's word. It helps to train us up. It helps to graduate us from milk to solid food, right? From baby Christian to mature Christian. And it's not just about building yourself up, but you can also be a part of building up others as well. That's the beauty of the church. There are over 100 scriptures that talk about how we treat each other as Christians. We call them the one another verses. Things like be at peace with one another. Don't grumble among one another. Be at the same mind with one another. Pray for one another. Greet one another with a kiss. Okay, that one's weird, all right? <laughs> Aren't you glad we don't greet each other with kisses anymore? I could just see, like, the host team training. Like, all right, when they walk in, just lay a wet, sloppy kiss right on them. Welcome to church, you know. <laughs> I thought we could get all the single guys signing up for host team. <laughs> Welcome to church. <laughs> You're all picturing it now, aren't you? <laughs> We could bring it back. I mean, I'm not against it. <laughs> no, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> now, I've heard people say things like, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And that is true, but I would argue that you're going to struggle to be a growing Christian without it. Because we can't follow through with these one another commands without actually being around one another, right? How else can we stir each other on to love and good deeds if we don't meet together? And, and for believers, the local church is your spiritual gym. It's a place you are trained to run your race. It's, it's a place you learn about God to grow in your knowledge. It's where we worship God so that we can grow in love. It's where we are ministered to by God's people to grow in godliness. And then we minister to others to grow in humility. It's where we come under the care and oversight of pastors and leaders who God has equipped to help us. The church exists to make disciples, to help Christians go from immature, milk-drinking baby Christians to strong and bold, solid men and women of God. 
We need his church to grow Christians in our world today. And the third purpose of the church is to reach the lost. Must be to reach the lost. While the church is a spiritual gym for believers, for unbelievers, the church should be like an outpost in the midst of enemy territory. You know, a military outpost is, it, it acts as kind of guard or defense against the enemy's attack. And we live in a fallen world that is in rebellion against God. And the church offers the good news of reconciliation, of forgiveness and hope in the darkness. The church is a lighthouse to the lost, calling them in. And unbelievers, we welcome them into our worship services. We want them to experience worship. We want them to hear the gospel. We want to give them a chance to receive God's grace and forgiveness. We want to help them get baptized. The church exists to evangelize. Do you remember the superhero, the invisible man? Okay, if you don't rem remember him, uh, he was invisible. Okay, that basically sums him up. Okay, he <laughs> never saw him. All right, get out of here. Come on. Don't steal all my jokes. Come on. The invisible man, uh, the only way to make him visible was, like, you had to throw something on him that would stick to him, right? Like paint or, like, flour or something. And so that's the only way you could fight him, right? You got to, like, cover him with something so you could actually see his shape and his movement. The local church, when functioning in love and unity with a mission to reach the lo it lost, is the paint that makes Christ visible to our world, Okay. It's what helps our world see Jesus through what we do in the local church. It's central to God's plan. In fact, many ways the local church is God's plan, A, for the world, today for working in the world. And no ministry will outshine it, and no program will replace it. No power can topple it. The Lord's church is, is his plan for our world, to work through our world, and he has no backup. And aren't you so thankful that God established the church for us, for our benefit, and for our world that needs it? I'm so thankful for God who knew what we would need, who knew that we couldn't go through this life on our own, that we needed to come together regularly to get encouraged because it's easy to lose hope in this world. It's powerful to come together. But it's funny, right, how we can know something is good for us, and yet, we still struggle to do it. We struggle to follow through, right? I mean, some of you just had every diet you've ever started flash before your mind, right? Like, we know it's good, but so is a cookie, you know? It's hard. It's hard to follow through, and it's because we can, we can get selfish and we make excuses. And so here's a few things to just how to counter your excuses, okay? The first thing is this. I want you to think about this. Go all in. When I was a kid growing up in church, we had three church services a week, all right? We went to Sunday morning service, we'd go home for lunch, take a little break, and then we would come back for a different service on Sunday night. A whole different message, a whole wor different worship team. And I just can't imagine that, like, for pastors having to write two messages a week. But then we would come also on Wednesday night for the midweek service. How many grew up in that era of church, all right? You went, like, multiple times a week, okay. Well, we're going to have a support group after you guys. We can all get together and talk about it. The good old days. And nowadays, though, average church attendance is about once a month for a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians. If you think about that, that's 12 days a year. Maybe 15 to about 18 hours out of your year. Some of you have more screen time in two days, you know, than the time you spend in church. Don't you just hate those screen time reports? I, they make me so mad. Um, I want to flip culture, though, right? I don't want to make church, like, on the back burner a low priority, but I want to flip it and see our church and see our, our members make it a priority in your life. And that's going to start when you structure your life around church. Make it a high priority on your Sunday morning. And as far as possible, do your best to let nothing interfere. And I know there's responsibilities and there's hobbies and, 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 you know, that can interfere. And one of those that I see a lot is sports. You know, my parents, they refused to sign me up for a sports league that met on Sunday mornings. They just said, we're not going to do it. Church is too much of a priority. And 
I'm pretty sure that's why I'm not a professional soccer player today. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's their fault. But they raised all their children in church with a love for God and his word, serving him. Parents, when you start to structure your weekly schedule around church, instead of fitting it in when it's convenient, you're showing your children the value of what it is to be a part of a community of believers. You're showing them how important it is, those one another commands, not to mention how life-changing it will be for your children to have godly friends and a godly community, because we know that makes a huge impact on their life. Structure your life around it, and not because it's legalistic, and it's not because you're going to get in trouble if you don't come. Nobody's taking attendance. We're not going to start doing roll call, but really it's just about creating consistency in your life. And we know anytime we, we stay consistent in our spiritual disciplines, we're going to grow. Consistency will cause growth. And I just want to encourage all the husbands and all the fathers in this place. Lead your family. You bear the ultimate responsibility to, for your family to stay committed to a local church and to actually attend. So you take the lead and be committed. Be excited to attend. Wake up early on Sunday morning and get your family ready. Show them the importance of coming to church. Get in the worship service and, and lift your hands and engage in the message and serve because your children are watching you. Lead your family. Be a father who takes the lead in this, not to mention your wife is going to instantly find you way more attractive, okay? Just a little tip, just a little tip, okay? Your wife's going to be like, that is my man worshiping. Come on. Lead in our family like a boss. <laughs> Fathers, God will bless you, and he will bless your family for taking the lead yeah. and being that spiritual leader. Yeah. And to the women who faithfully show up and their husbands are home, I just want you to know that God sees you. Yeah. Keep praying for your husband. Keep loving him and serving him and respecting him. God is going to bless you for your obedience and your faithfulness. He doesn't forget about you. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus tells this parable. He says this, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who'd been invited, Come, everything is ready. So he sends out his servant, and, and they start talking to people. And in verse 18, it says, they all started to make excuses. The first one they talked to said this, well, um, so uh, I bought a field, and um, so I gotta go out and see it, so I'm gonna have to be excused, I can't come to the party, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and that's just, can we just say that's a weak excuse, okay? I mean, who buys a field without seeing it first, all right? Not to mention, land cannot run away, all right? So he could literally go the next day. And it's not going anywhere, but he just, he made an excuse. The second guy in verse 19 said, oh, um, I'd love to come, but I bought five yoke of oxen and I got to go examine them. Uh, so please have me be excused. This excuse is also really silly, right? Like you, you're trying to tell me you want to go work on some oxen and miss a party. Oxen are not exciting, all right? I'm not even sure what an oxen is, but it sounds really lame. <laughs> and then the last guy, this is my favorite one, the third excuse. He goes, oh, <laughs> he goes, oh, I married a wife. <laughs> I can't come. <laughs> I'll be like, you don't want to invite her with you? Like, are you that embarrassed of her? You don't want to have her come to the party? I can't help but think that Jesus used such ridiculous excuses just to show that really what it was is that these three guys were just unwilling to partake of the feast. They had no desire to accept the invitation. And fast forward today, right, our excuses haven't evolved very much, maybe not oxen anymore, but we have a lot of them. And I don't think our, our excuses are going to help us out anymore. Because look at this. 
In verse 21, it says, so the servant came back and reported these things to the master. The master of the house became angry, and he said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. There's always room in God's house, right? And the master said to his servant, well, then go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. And in verse 24, it says this, for I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet to me that's the saddest part of the story they missed out the master was throwing a banquet no expense withheld the best food the best entertainment yet they missed it their excuses just hurt them and they missed out have you ever heard of a guy named ronald wayne probably not he was the third co-founder of Apple with Steve Jobs and Steve uh, Rosniak. Um, he was the guy who came up actually with the Apple logo, uh, the first manual he drafted, the first partnership agreement. He had a 10% share in Apple, which at the time, it didn't seem like a lot. But now, 10% is worth upwards of 95 billion dollars billion I said billion with a B that's a lot that's a lot of money billion that's a lot of zeros but get this two weeks after he got that 10% stake he sold for a whopping eight hundred dollars I just picture him perpetually like this what like like that's just always how I see him But it's a great reminder, right? He sold himself way too short. And all our excuses do is sell God short because he has more for us. He's prepared a banquet for us. The kingdom of God is at our fingertips and he has invited us to partake of it. But it can fall through if we aren't willing to go all in to say, God, you can have all of me. In the temple, there was the outer court and the inner court, right? And the outer court was open, and it was kind of open to the public, the general and uh, people. But then the inner court was reserved. It was where the presence of God was. And only the priesthood, only very select people could enter into the inner courts. And, And it makes me think about us as believers that sometimes we only let God into our outer court of our life. And there's parts of us, there's inner parts of us, there's maybe dark parts of us, maybe hidden parts of us that we have shut the door and said, God, you cannot come in to these parts. And we have all the excuses, right? And some of them are good and some of them are justified, but God is still standing there knocking, saying, open the door, let me into all of you, let me come in. Give me all of your life. Stop holding back because you're just missing out. We got to open our life even to the deepest, darkest parts of us and pull back that curtain of the inner parts of our lives and allow God to come in and work through our life because it's in this place of intimacy with God that we're going to find transformation. We're going to find his promises come alive to us. We're going to experience the power of his presence. And we're going to go from just knowing a lot about God to actually being known by God. And I don't know what excuses you've made in your life. But I know this, that they probably haven't been good for you. In fact, I would maybe say that those excuses have been a burden to your life, weighing you down. And today, I just want to give you the opportunity to go before God and say, God, I'm done with the excuses. Whatever it is, whatever those excuses are, in any way they're holding you back from him, and just say, God, I'm done with the excuses. I'm going to lead like you've called me to lead. I'm going to open the door to the dark parts of my life and let you begin to work. I'm going to lay them down, and I'm going to go all in so I can step into all you have for me. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? I just want to first take the opportunity to give anyone in this room an opportunity to respond to God and and to give your life to him. Maybe for the first time you're in this place and you're like, I'm the unbeliever that walked through these doors. And God has been speaking to you this whole time that you've been here that it's time to lay your excuses down and to become a follower of Jesus, to receive that hope and forgiveness. Or maybe you've made a decision to follow Christ in your life, but you have been running from God. You are far from him and it's time to come home. 
It's time to come home. If you want to pray that prayer, it's so simple. You can just pray it with me right now. Lord, we just thank you for your for your death and resurrection on the cross. And Lord, we right now, we ask that you come into our life, that you forgive our sins, and that you make us a new creation in you, Lord. We receive your forgiveness. And Lord, we commit our lives to you that we will live for you and love you all the days of our life, God. Thank you for making us new, for welcoming us into your family, and for calling us son and daughter. We love you, Lord. In your precious name we pray, amen. Amen. If you made that decision to follow Christ today for the first time or rededicate your life to him, would you just lift up your hands real quick because we want to give you a Bible right now and get some stuff in your hands to make sure you have some resources as you start the best journey of your life. And church, the rest of you, would you just stand to your feet? And as we worship now, I just want you to call out to God. I want you to take your excuses before him and repent and say, God, I'm done. I'm tired of carrying these around, and I'm tired of letting them hold me back. But I'm ready to go all in to be a part of your church, to be a growing Christian, to mature, and to become bold and strong into who you created me to be, God. So we're going to worship him, and we're going to invite his presence into this place right now. Lord, we love you. And we we thank you for what you have spoken to our hearts today, God. We thank you that you meet us in this place, that when we draw near to you, you promise to draw near to us. So we worship you now, Lord. We lift up our voices to you, and we invite you to move in this place, Lord, and do the work in our life that only you can do. Holy Spirit, move in this place. In your precious name, we pray.